I'd like to begin our session today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which our presentation has been filmed, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Elders past and present and to any Elders who are attending this presentation. Today's presenter, John Marsden, is the principal of Candlebark School and the Alice Miller School, which are located 60 kilometres northwest of Melbourne and enrolled 390 students in 2020. In addition to creating both these schools, John is an accomplished author and has written more than 40 books. Today, John talks about how the outdoor areas are fundamental to the school's program. John also explores why the outdoor areas are so important to the well-being and development of children. This presentation also reviews the history of how school grounds have been designed and how this is still influencing the design of school grounds today. John shares how his own influences and the broader school philosophies are integrated into the day-to-day -day use of the school grounds. We hope you enjoy this presentation. I'm John Marsden and welcome to Candlebark School which is now in its 15th year and I've been principal for all that time, self-appointed, which was the best way to get the job I found. I'd been for a few interviews and gone through a few application processes to be principal of other schools and had failed every time. So finally I interviewed myself and appointed myself to the job and uh, it went very smoothly. So uh, here I still am. I wanted to talk a bit about the history of schools without uh, trying to teach my grandmothers to suck eggs, but I think if we look back at the Industrial Revolution, that's where the modern schooling system started, as many of you would be well aware. And so it was an economic thing that you wanted to get as many workers as possible into factories and coal mines and so on. And so the existence of villages and little communities scattered through the countryside was not helpful to the factory owners and the mine owners. And so we had urbanisation, the growth of cities, and the need for the mine owners and factory owners to employ people for very long hours, which meant that something had to be done for their children. And so schools were established, which were operated on very economic grounds in that you had the fewest number of adults possible looking after the greatest number of kids possible in the smallest space possible because it was expensive to have bigger spaces. And one of the kind of legacies of that that I think is really unforgivable in Australia which has perhaps more space than any other country in the world, that we've followed that same model and we're still squashing huge numbers of kids into very tiny spaces, allocating very few adults to work with them. And if you go to many city schools in particular and suburban schools, you'll find that the recreation area is about the size of a couple of basketball courts, even though there might be 300, 600, 800 kids in the school. And I find that very hard to comprehend, especially when you walk down the road a, a K or so and find a, I don't know, a 60 acre golf course where there might be a dozen or so um, people about my age and about my body weight kind of um, ambling around on their, or rolling around on their buggies playing golf. And there's something very wrong with that picture. So in starting Candlebark, I was very determined that we would have as much space as possible. And so we've got this bush block essentially, where there's about a thousand, over a thousand acres of bush, which surrounds the school buildings. And the unofficial motto of the school is take risks. I used to call it a secret motto, but I've been talking about it too much now for it to be a secret any longer. So take risks is our motto, but that doesn't mean be reckless. It doesn't mean be negligent. It means to have adventures, to be adventurous, to have an adventurous spirit. And when you think about the Australian bush, we do have an unconscious fear of it, which seems to be a collective fear in our society, but it's not based very logically on, on much that we should really fear. So that, yes, there are snakes on this property and the kids see them from time to time. And we do brief the kids very comprehensively and frequently on how to deal with snakes and snake bites. They're, when they go out into the bush, they take with them a first aid kit, which includes compression bandages and so on in case of a snake bite. And they go in groups of three so that if someone is bitten, the, the uh, one person can stay with them and someone else can come back and get help. We also have falling branches and falling trees from time to time. 
and there is the possibility that children could get lost in the bush but really we're not in the middle of uh, the Simpson Desert they're not going to be lost for terribly long around here and as I've said to parents frequently the most dangerous part of being a student here is when your child is driven to school or picked up and taken home from school at the beginning of the day or the end of the day because there's there are far more hazards on the roads than there are in the bush but we do have this I think quite illogical unconscious fear of the bush which is one of the many factors which has caused us to be very conservative and very anxious and very protective of children in ways which are damaging them subtly but powerfully and profoundly damaging them emotionally and damaging them socially and damaging them spiritually we've become so concerned I think about physical injuries and that has taken over our parenting and our teaching to such an extent that in protecting them from physical injury we are causing them to suffer other injuries that are more abstract less visible but can impact on their adult lives and their future careers and the, the way they uh, live their lives in ways that are very unhelpful to them so we actively work against that one of the things that happens at Candlebark is we get lots of visits from educators which is lovely and we've had teachers from all over the world come here and that includes school leaders and people who are in quite powerful positions and it's now become it's reached a point where I kind of know the script which I'm not very happy about but it does tend to be a very predictable script where they'll spend all day in the school and they'll be full of praise they'll be full of nice comments they'll be full of admiration apparently for what we do and how we do it but at the end of the day we have the final meeting where they'll always say to me look we love what you're doing you know we wish we could do this but and it's that word but which is inevitable in these conversations and they rattle off the reasons they can't do these things in their schools and the reasons are usually to do with regulations they're worried about government inspectors and people from the department who might make it uh, impossible for them to do what we do and there's plenty of evidence out there that that's not the case that the government the department the inspectors the regulators will tolerate quite a lot of adventurous play and adventurous uh, activities but there's also and I don't want to go into this in too much detail because there's a lot of things I wanted to cover today there's also the knowledge that I've gained over the years that the regulators themselves can often be confronted and faced down so when you actually engage in a debate with them and start to challenge and question the assumptions that they're working from you realize that often those assumptions are based on nothing except a personal opinion they're not based on anything that's actually stated anywhere in black and white in regulations and so you can often win those arguments those debates those battles which can be very much for the good of the school the people who come here also say well the insurance would be so expensive we couldn't we couldn't manage the insurance we wouldn't be able to get insurance but that's simply not true we've had insurance believe me ever since the school opened and we have kids riding horses we have them climbing trees we have them rolling down hills we have them on skateboards and ripsticks we have them on bikes we have them on things called Munro boards which are wild skateboards that go down any sort of terrain they're like four-wheel drives or something like that in terms of skateboards and at first I only allowed the older kids to ride on them but now the little kids ride on them too and in 15 years we haven't had any significant injury or accident as a result of any of this stuff except an occasional broken bone maybe three or four in 15 years and just not severe breaks no one's been you know tragically hurt there's been uh, endless bruises scratches scrapes and grazes thousands of them that's fine I'm very uh, un unconcerned unbothered by that we treat them and we put a band-aid on or wash them or whatever they need add a bit of disinfectant but we expect kids to be physically resilient and to develop inner strength and they won't do that if they're being cosseted and protected and uh, nursed all the way through childhood and adolescence they say that every scar tells a story so if someone ends up with a bad cut here and they get a scar on their hand for the rest of their lives that's fine they can always tell the story about it when they're 90 years old and get cued off from their great-grandchildren for being so daring and adventurous when they were young but um, it's just part of the uh, 
total package that we offer, to the kind of education, call it holistic if you like, but the kind of education that we offer. And certainly the insurance company doesn't bat an eyelid. They pay the claims when we make them, which isn't very often. We've had far fewer accidents of any significance than any comparable school in the area. And <clears throat> I think that's a powerful understanding for people to have. I was told by the principal of a big government primary school, not terribly far from here, that they had an ambulance almost perfectly, permanently parked at the school. We've had, I don't know, maybe half a dozen ambulances here in 15 years, maybe a dozen. I haven't been counting, but uh, there's never been anything that's caused us to feel that there's a real uh, sense of jeopardy for the students here. And the third thing that people give as their reason for not being able to do what we do is that they'd be sued by people, they'd be in the courts, the courts would punish them in some way. And when I challenge them on that, they're not able to really base that on anything very logical or anything real. It's all just kind of a bit of uh, primitive fear in a sense, a bit of um, almost a superstitious fear. Because the courts, in fact, have nearly always supported schools in the way that they do things. It's very rare for a school to be successfully sued for negligence. And frankly, if a teacher is negligent or reckless, they deserve to be sued, and so does the school. So I don't have any sympathy for, for people in that situation. I might have sympathy for them, but I certainly recognise that the court has a right to rule against them in those circumstances. But no court will find that a kid riding bike, a bike at school or playing down ball or riding on a ripstick is in any way doing anything which is somehow uh, showing negligence or recklessness on the, on the part of the school. The High Court has actually said, we do not expect teachers to have eyes in the backs of their heads. And that was during a case where some teachers on playground duty were supposed to be negligent because they hadn't seen something happening behind them where one kid was hurting another kid. And the court said, we recognise the reality. There's not a hundred teachers on duty out there in the playground. There's only one or two, and that's the way it is. And that's uh, a, a fact of life. So there's been this constant um, support for schools doing what we do. And if we have to find reasons for not doing things this way, we have to look elsewhere, I'd, I'd suggest. So after 15 years, I'd say that our children, our students are in pretty good shape. They have a resilience which is real. And it shows very strongly when they go to our secondary campus, which has only been going four years, and because it's only been going a short time, we've taken in a lot of students who've got different educational backgrounds. So they've gone to other primary schools and then they come to us in year seven, along with a large number from Candlebark who've been through the school here from maybe prep onwards. And they go to the secondary campus in year seven. And the difference between the two groups has been really quite staggering to us. And in a way, rewarding to us because we we take it as confirmation that what we're doing is working, but it's also troubling. When we find the kids from other schools, for example, will burst into tears and ring their mother or father if they've lost a textbook or if they can't find the right classroom or if they're not sure what subject they have next, so often the reaction is one of panic. And I find that to be getting worse every year and to be a deeply disturbing aspect of adolescence and of child raising in Australia it's not a problem with the kids who've been through Candlebark because they've already done so many hikes, they've done so many sleepovers, they've done so many camps that they can cope with little things like losing a textbook or not finding a classroom. And there is a really profound difference in the way our students respond when they're faced by challenging or stressful situations. It does seem that stress and anxiety have become pandemic in the last 10 years or so in Australia. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that we are doing this physical protection thing to such an extent that we are causing tremendous emotional harm. And we're talking about playgrounds, obviously, specifically today, and we see it in playgrounds where anything that could possibly hurt anyone has been removed. And we're left with these soulless places, these places which lack any spirit. They lack any energy. They're full of plastic. They don't engage children, they don't allow for imaginative play, they don't allow for people to be adventurous, that's for sure. 
And so when we see people who are still committed to doing playgrounds that are truly interesting and creative and different and full of possibilities, that does my heart good. Because going th past most of the playgrounds I see in most schools and in most public parks, I now feel just depressed because they are such um, soulless and, and barren places. One of the absolutely um, founding principles of Candlebark is that children must have first-hand experiences. And the school started in a way because of my gradual awareness that conversations with young people were becoming more and more boring. And I thought, well, is it me? Am I getting so boring that I'm making these conversations boring? And I quickly dismissed that as a possibility very quickly and decided it must be them. But I did quite seriously start listening more and thinking more about what children were talking about. And I soon became aware that they were talking mostly about what they'd seen on TV the night before. If they had other stories, it was often about things other people had done. So it might be something that their grandparents had done or something their parents had done, or it might be something that uh, someone had done that they'd heard about or read about or mo most likely seen on TV. So in modern terms, I'd say Bear Grylls and Top Gear were the kind of things they would talk about where they would sit at home in a lounge chair, eating chips or whatever, and watching other people have first-hand experiences. And that has now spread into education very quickly on a huge scale where we're being encouraged to think that somehow having these virtual experiences, virtual reality, doing things on computers, playing computer games, having computer education, computerized education, somehow that's as good or maybe even better than a first-hand experience. And we absolutely reject that as a basis for life, as a basis for education, as a basis for child raising. And so what we do instead is to insist well, we don't do it forcefully and in an authoritarian way, but we do absolutely commit and make sure that all our students commit to being part of a curriculum here, a program here, which is all to do with first-hand experiences. So from prep onwards, from the first term of prep onwards, our children go on camps. There's a camp that they do in first term, which is about uh, three hours, four hours drive away from here. They're in tents, they're there for four days and three nights. And this is all the primary age children from grade prep to grade six. And some parents do get anxious about this and they get agitated about it, but we insist that they, they must uh, embrace this if they're going to enroll their kids here. And I'd have to say that in all the years we've been doing those camps, 15 of them, We've had a few kids who are homesick, but they could just as easily come from grade six as from prep. There's no chronological determinant about homesickness. It's more to do with personality and temperament and previous life experiences. And so when we get kids who are homesick, it could be anyone. There's no, uh, there's no more greater um, occurrence of it among the five-year-olds than there is among the 12 or 13-year-olds. We also have bike camps all the time. We have sleepovers, which could be for anything. It could be a grade three sleepover. It could be a sleepover for, for people who love reading and they just want time to be able to read without being interrupted. And so those sleepovers are open to anyone from prep to grade six. And we usually get about 20, 25 kids who'll sign up for those. We might have an explosions club sleepover because we do have an explosions club, which is an elective and involves fireworks and uh, learning all sorts of stuff. I haven't gone into it very deeply because I don't think I want to know any more about it than the fact that I trust the teacher who runs it. We have sleepovers for um, just camping in the bush. We have sleepovers where kids go and uh, cook their meals on a, on a camp oven and sleep in tents right at the school here. We might have a sleepover which is just for fun. It might be full of games where they play spotlight and uh, capture the flag and stuff like that in the dark which is even more fun than playing it in daylight. And so it's, I suppose that most kids would spend, gee, about um, 20 to 30 nights a year at school or away on camps or excursions or similar activities. It uh, increases in, in duration as kids get older. So by year nine, they're away for six weeks. 
and they could be going anywhere. We've had trips to uh, Tanzania, for example, for year nines, trips to Mongolia, trips to Lithuania, trips to uh, uh, France and Italy and Spain and so on. We have uh, bike camps, which I've mentioned before, which can go for four or five days. We have people going to WOMAD, the multicultural festival in South Australia. We have people going to the Mona Gallery in Hobart and spending a few more days in Tasmania as well. And all of this is done economically. We're not extravagant. It's all included in the school fees, which are quite moderate. And we do it that way because we don't want arguments about money, but also we don't want endless bureaucratic rubbish filling up our time. So all those little notes home and little notes back and people sending in $5.50 to pay for a visit to an art gallery or something, we just do away with all that for the sake of efficiency and convenience and to stop any uh, sort of trivial arguments about whether they should be uh, going at a particular time or coming back at a particular time or whether the, the, uh, the lunch should be two sandwiches or three sandwiches. We just try to do away with all that stuff and just make it very clear to parents from the day that they inquire about enrolling their children at the school that this is the kind of school we run and this is why we run it. If there's one thing lacking in education in Australia today, it's that educators have sadly become too timid, I think. There was a time when our educational leaders would be trailblazers in society. They would be the people who would talk about what kind of society we want, how we're going to achieve it, what we need to do in schools to help us achieve it. And they would be people who would pioneer new ideas and would often provoke controversy by doing so, but they seemed unafraid to do it. Now it seems like there's a new culture where we try to placate everyone, we try to please everyone, we try to negotiate everything, and I find that incomprehensible and completely, um, what's the word, it's, it doesn't result in the worthwhile outcomes because you can't please everyone. And I guess one of the things that I've had to battle against during my teaching career has been the idea that many people have that they kind of own their children. It's the same thing that women complained about absolutely with, with every justification for thousands of years and there's finally been more action on that front in the last few decades where women have started to make it very clear that they are not the possessions of the man to whom they are connected by marriage or whatever other relationship it might be. We now need to move on as, and as well as continuing to fight that fight, we need to fight the fight for children and make it clear to parents that they do not own their children in the sense that they can control everything the child does, everything the child thinks, every idea the child has, every belief the child holds. The child has to have autonomy, the child has to be able to determine their own path in life and of course they'll be influenced by their parents but that doesn't mean the children can be kept in ignorance for example by their parents and it doesn't mean that the parents can brainwash the children with attitudes and beliefs and values that will isolate the children and cause them to become on the edges of society, the fringe dwellers of society. They need to be taught about how the world really works and so that's why we are assertive in the way we deal with parents. We're, we're nice to them, we get on well with them, but we make it clear that we know what we're doing, we know why we're doing it, and we're not going to be bullied into taking a different course by one or two or half a dozen parents who have some, what seems to be often an irrational belief that things should be done differently. So that takes some strength and there are times when even though I'm not very confident in dealing with some of the parents I've had to deal with, I have to act confident and project confidence and know what I'm talking about. And I guess all those decades as a teacher must be worth something. And all those years we spent at university learning about pedagogical techniques must be worth something. So it's the old kind of humorous analogy that I don't go into my dental surgery and tell the dentist how he needs to fill my tooth. And I don't, don't expect the dentist to, to come into the school and tell us how we need to be teaching maths to the grade threes. So it's, a, uh, it's an ongoing kind of tension for educators in the 21st century and one that we need to be very aware of and I think develop more strength and more confidence and become more articulate in 
explaining why we do things and advocating for the way we do things. So what we have here is what, what I call the soccer field and uh, the kids sometimes, when I ask them, you know, what would you like to see at the school? What do you think we should change? One of their first responses is, can't we have a level soccer field? Can't we have a flat soccer field? And I deliberately haven't ever attempted to, to bring that in because I think one of the problems we have at the moment with young people is we try and make everything so easy for them and so comfortable. And that's not helpful at all. It's good for them to learn to play soccer on this sloping pitch because when they get on a flat field at a lovely lush soccer club, then they've been through the hard experiences of learning skills here and so they play soccer all the more successfully. It's part of the terrain of Australia that we have uneven surfaces and slopes. That's nature. There are no straight lines in nature except by an incredible fluke. But the mania for straight lines that we have in our society, I don't have a lot of sympathy with. Up here is um, a whole lot of cubbies that kids have built or in the, and they're in a constant state of uh, improvement and modification and expansion. They collapse from time to time, but um, it's an endlessly fascinating activity for them as it was for me when I was a kid. And I do think that one thing about children is that if they've got dirt, sand, water, those three elements can keep them occupied very happily for very long periods of time. And the other thing they do up here is to play what they call stick wars. And I've never quite figured out the rules of stick wars, but it certainly involves having a stick and having sword fights with other kids. And there's also great status in having a good stick. So if it's a really big one and it's really solid, then that gives you special kind of uh, power. And there's much competition over who's got the best stick. And they will try and steal other people's sticks and make them their own, which leads to all kinds of confrontations. But again, the stick wars have been going on now for most of the 15 years the school's been operating. And yeah, occasionally someone gets wrapped on the knuckles or whatever by a stick. But again, no serious injuries. There's this constant um, preoccupation with the idea that children will hurt themselves so readily, but they don't. They get very sensible very quickly. In the first few days of Candlebark's life, we did have kids whizzing around on bikes at high speed. And a couple of times, kids coming out of buildings were knocked over by the bikes. And there was a bit of concern about that, but we didn't make a big fuss of it. And within a few days, the problem disappeared and we've never had it happen since because the people coming out of buildings started to realise that they needed to look around when they came out. And the people riding the bikes realised that they had to look around when they were riding the bikes and be aware of other people. And so the, the ability to think outside yourself and to think of the wider picture is not something that you're born with. It's something that you'll acquire or it can be repressed so that you never develop it. And there is a problem, I think, in a lot of situations in Australia and the Western world where people don't develop that ability. But they certainly develop it here just through the school of hard knocks, you could call it. But like I said, the knocks they get are pretty mild and uh, very helpful to their overall development. Because we're not interested in this idea that children are cute, sweet, little gorgeous creatures who have to be coddled and looked after and protected. I think that's very harmful to children and completely false because children are like any other age group. They have a range of emotions, a range of behaviours, a range of feelings and attitudes. They can be generous, kind, caring, loving. They can be honest. They can also be cruel, cynical, dishonest, greedy, selfish, jealous and so on. Just the full range of emotions. The idea that they are somehow pure and innocent is a construct that adults like to believe in. And many people believe in it devoutly and passionately, but it leads to some very serious problems. One problem is that when a child behaves in a way that is clearly not sweet and innocent, like they've grabbed the last two pieces of cake so someone else has missed out entirely, or they've um, hurt the cat or the dog or the little sibling, then we're just horrified and shocked and outraged. If a child swears, we think it's the end of the world. 
And that's got nothing to do with the true nature of childhood. It's to do with the false structure or image of childhood that we have developed because it gratifies us to believe that children do have these pure and innocent approaches to life. But the other problem it raises is that when you reach the end of childhood, there's no way to go but down. If you've been pure, sweet, innocent and gorgeous for 10, 12 years, then that's going to come to an end. And so we characterize adolescence as an awful time, a time of dreadful rebellion and horrible behaviors and shocking attitudes and uh, disgraceful conduct, which is completely unhelpful to adolescence and again, completely false. Because having taught adolescence for, I don't know, 40 years or something now, I can tell you that you should already know this, of course, that uh, they also have the full range of emotions and behaviors and attitudes and feelings and opinions. There are some adolescents who are troubled and who need a great deal of support and a great deal of guidance and a great deal of help. But there are also some 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds and 80-year-olds who are troubled and dysfunctional and need a great deal of support and help. There are many adolescents who are terrific people wonderful, compassionate, empathetic, supportive, caring, honest, but at the same time they will have their moments where they will behave badly according to the way we use those words good and bad. And so to look at things as they truly are rather than to rely on these very shallow, very illusory concepts is to help young people in a much more meaningful way because by characterizing them as gorgeous or rebellious or sweet or evil, then we're doing them a lot of damage. It's important to just recognize that just like us, there are things I do, there are times when I don't tell the truth, like when my wife said to me yesterday, notice anything different about me? And I had to um, do a bit of desperate bluffing. Um, <laughs> and there are times when I can be greedy, I can be selfish, I can be cruel and so on and so on just like every other human being on the planet. One of the things we do here is to deal with problem situations. And I should say in passing that we don't take a selective group of students who are all kind of have some sort of holy light, uh, some aura shining around them. We have uh, many students who've had great difficulties in their lives. Many of them have been to a number of schools before they come here. So we're not working with a, some sort of chosen, particularly talented and brilliant group at all. They're just a, a cross-section, a full range of, of personalities. And when there's a problem, when they do behave badly, we don't bother with all those institutionalized punishments that schools are so fond of and which don't work. And I know as a veteran of the detention room when I was at school, I was in detention so often that the teachers offered to name the room after me at one point. I had uh, three hour detentions on Saturday morning so often that I hardly ever had a Saturday when I wasn't in detention. And I know that the same kids were in detention with me every week. And so you would think that after a year or two or three or five, the teachers might think, gee, this isn't really working. It's not changing their behaviors. But that seems to be a very hard lesson for some people to learn. So we don't bother with that stuff. What we do is talk. So if someone's done something that's really cruel or selfish or dishonest, then we'll talk to them. And that might be a very short conversation where I'll say to them, don't ever do that again, because I'll be very angry if I see any behavior like that from you in the future. And even that would be twice as long as, I'd, uh, as a statement I might normally make to them. Or the conversations might go on for months and they might take many, many hours because there might be a lot of difficulties there that need to be unpacked, a lot of unlearning that needs to happen. And unlearning is harder than learning. And so that can be a very patient, prolonged process. And finding the patience to do it is not easy for anyone, including me. But I know that that's more likely to bring about worthwhile results. One of the things we do which is unhelpful to children is to try to create heroes out of, out of other human beings as though they are somehow infinitely superior to everyone else. They are to be almost worshipped. And that then creates in children the idea that they're inadequate that they are unsatisfactory, that they don't measure up. But when you look at those people we're taught to admire in their entirety, we find that just like all the rest of us, they have their good and bad aspects. They have their likable and unlikable qualities. So stick wars and uh, soccer and building cubbies, 
people will behave wonderfully and badly, they'll behave beautifully and in hurtful ways at times, but that's all part of life.